The World Health Organization divides a pandemic into six levels. After the H5N1 outbreaks in 2004, level three was already declared, the highest level of warning. As soon as a possible super virus is discovered anywhere, the next highest levels are activated. At the US Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, the government has implemented an operation center for dealing with all kinds of epidemics on a national or international level. In case of an influenza pandemic, this is where all information is gathered and evaluated by experts. Well, first, this operation center is 24-7. Since it's, uh, we established it, uh, the, uh, the operation center uh, has been in 24-7 uh, operations. And so we're normally um, monitoring activity uh, throughout the United States and globally. So as soon as an influenza supervirus is detected, the alarm is triggered. The actions proposed in the U.S. National Pandemic Plan are then coordinated with federal agencies and institutions from this center. Not long ago, the world was on the brink of a pandemic. In 2003, the completely unknown infectious lung disease, SARS, spread fear throughout Asia and indeed other continents. In many countries, strict border controls using heat-sensitive cameras and the taking of temperatures attempted to filter out infected travelers at the point of entry and, when necessary, have them placed under immediate quarantine. In the case of an influenza pandemic, the experts place little faith in special health checks on passengers at airports. It's simply impossible to find out who carries the virus. So from our standpoint, and I think for all countries, it also means having good surveillance at the borders. Questions of how we look at people as they come into the country to see whether or not they've, they've, they've got signs of disease. Uh, the kinds of questions that we ask people when they come into the country about where they've been, if they've been in places where they may have been exposed to some of these diseases, and, and, and initial management of those people. Most airport entry checks will have to make do with these kind of vague surveys to filter out any potential virus carriers. We have also run simulations as to what would happen if inspections were introduced at airports and feverish patients wanting to enter the country were put into quarantine. But with influenza, such measures would have very little effect. That's because very many people with an influenza infection show absolutely no symptoms. A lot of people who have picked up the infection abroad are probably showing no symptoms when they arrive here and only develop them later. So far too many will pass through the checks, and at the best, all we're doing is holding up the entry of the disease for one or two days. There is also the real possibility of serious infection on board the aircraft. The airlines already have procedures in place. If a passenger is ill on board, airlines can take precautions, and they're going to be simple infection control precautions. We may be able to isolate uh, a passenger at a part of the plane that uh, isn't occupied. Um, but in addition, we can uh, enforce hand washing or recommend hygiene procedures, uh, sneezing or coughing into a tissue uh, until the passenger can get on the ground and, and then be assessed. An airline will report that their international rival has someone that is ill on board. We, along with our partners in, uh, with the other federal agencies, and especially EMS, the Emergency Medical Services folks here at the airport, will respond to the air airline. Um, we will do an assessment. Uh, those that need immediate medical care will be transferred to uh, a local hospital where they can receive isolation if needed and follow-on care. Uh, those that may have been exposed will be provided information um, and followed up. Measures like these are part of pandemic plans in many countries in Europe and the United States. These plans are usually a catalog of graduated procedures recommended to the authorities of the federal states. While the virus is still spreading unhindered, crisis teams would be at work putting the pandemic plan into operation. 
The main thrust is towards avoiding person-to-person -person contact and the risk of mutual infection. I think a lot of common sense is going to be required. You know, we're going to have to depend on people's innate common sense to try and contain this. If people get into panic mode, it's definitely not going to help. So, you know, you will not put your head in a lion's den. You will not go and visit your friend when he or she phones up and says, I'm in bed with influenza, unless they're really desperate. You know, you'll say, well, you know, have some tea, look after yourself, and I'll come around and see you in a few days. You know, it'll have to be that sort of thing. Ways of trying to prevent yourself getting infected. Increase the hygiene, get the surfaces clean. Because a lot of the time you could pick up the virus from doorknobs, telephones, typewriters, touch your lips, get yourself infected. To avoid a panic, the authorities are relying on information and explanation, leaflets, telephone hotlines, and of course, news reports in the mass media. Even so, there will be many cases of severe infection, which will strain the health system to its limits. General practitioners might not be able to deal with the onrush of patients, and if many people are reporting ill, there might be a shortage of staff in every kind of public service. I think it's important for people to understand to how, how things would work in their community. They should think about the possibility that their, their society may not function for a period of time as it does now. That means it might get very serious. Hospitals would be very quickly overwhelmed. Many people would die. Yet the number of seriously ill cases and fatalities could be considerably reduced if the sick person is immediately treated with so-called antiviral drugs. They are currently the only and most effective weapon against the virus. In a modern society, you say, right, this innate immune system, we will back it up, we will boost it with vaccines. We will help it with antiviral drugs. We will stop superinfection with bacteria, with antibiotics. And so applying all those modern technologies and discoveries, we will force the death rate down and down and down and down. Only these antiviral drugs, known as Tamiflu and Relenza, are capable of fighting an influenza virus once it's entered the body. The problem is, they're expensive, and the manufacturer's production capacity is limited. Nevertheless, the World Health Organization recommends that every nation should stockpile enough antivirals to treat 20% of the population. Up to now, tests on animals have shown good results against the aggressive H5N1 virus, on condition the treatment begins within 48 hours after onset of the symptoms. The active ingredient targets the virus's Achilles heel. It blocks the active sites of the neuraminidase and prevents the newly created virus from detaching itself from the surface of the cell. It can't reproduce. The destruction is halted. The pandemic plan has prioritized who will be the first to be given the antivirals. At the local level for distribution of, say, antivirals are, are broadly um, all kind of measures uh, that may be applicable. Uh, is, is a lot of those plans are being uh, developed now. Uh, and the distribution, there actually is a, 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 a very robust distribution system that already is ex existent within the private sector and, and the local and state public health sector. Although the pandemic plan is not too specific about distribution, one thing is clear. The majority of people will have to do without these antivirals. There are also difficulties when it comes to vaccination. Yeah, I think that uh, this is something that the public needs to clearly understand. And that is, once the uh, pandemic starts, we'll be able to take that pandemic virus to give it to vaccine manufacturing companies and uh, they will turn it into vaccine that will be protective against um, this particular strain. But that vaccine won't come online, uh, even in very small quantities, for three or four months after the pandemic starts. Significant quantities of vaccine won't be available for a year. 
The production process is difficult. The aggressive virus must be rendered harmless before it can reproduce in hen's eggs. In 2004, the US government sponsored a trial vaccine against the H5N1 virus. Tests with volunteers have proved successful. Here we've tested in 450, about 450 healthy adult volunteers. They've been given vaccine at one of a number of doses. Um, and we follow them afterwards for what side effects they have. And then we draw their blood before and after vaccination to see if they've made an immune response to the vaccine. And in terms of the immune responses, we've found that when we give the higher doses of the vaccine and give two of them a month apart, that people make an immune response that we think would protect them against H5N1, the avian. If there is the possibility of a pandemic, the experts advise staying at home and cutting back on social contacts, especially children. And most people will have to protect themselves by following simple rules of hygiene. Despite the swift imposition of measures, there will very likely be a state of emergency on a scale that will temporarily cripple public life and the national economy. Schools, kindergartens, theatres, cinemas and football stadiums will remain closed, with consequences for the whole economy. <laughs>